Right, this is on acids, bases, and neutral substances. All right, so chemical properties. Acids, bases, and neutral substances have chemical properties. So they are observed when a chemical undergoes a chemical change. So we've talked about chemical changes. That's when you end up with a new substance. And some examples of uh, chemical properties are your flammability. So does something catch on fire? Reactivity, does it react with, um, for example, like does iron react with the oxygen in the air and you get rust? That shows reactivity. Combustibility, when something can explode, such as like fireworks. And then having a pH or potential hydrogen, okay? And you'll see why that's important in a minute. Chemical properties, they're involved in the breaking and making of bonds in chemicals. So when bonds are being broken and reformed, you will see these chemical properties. Acids, they are compounds that produce hydronium ions or H3O plus when in water. And you think, well, how does that happen? Well, let me show you. So if we have something like hydrochloric acid, which is something you used in class, it has an H plus in it. It has a hydrogen in it right here at the beginning. Okay, that tells me that this is an acid. Now, what happens to this little hydrogen here? The hydrogen, when you put it into um, water, the hydrogen is going to attach to the water and make this hydronium ion, okay? So, for example, the hydrochloric acid you used in class, it was hydrochloric acid put in water. So, we did have these little hydronium molecules in there, okay? All right, some properties of acids. It says, although tasting a compound as a means of identifying it is never smart, you taste acidic compounds every day. And they give some examples here of like vinegar, oranges, and lemons, or limes. These are limes. And they have a sour taste. All right, another one. Acids are corrosive, meaning they wear away other materials. So if you have an acid and it sits on something or um, it hits it over time, you can see that it can, we call it corroding or being corrosive. So here we have a statue and the statue has had acid rain hitting on it for a long time. And you can see how it's corroded the statue itself and you can no longer see all its features. All right, so something else to kind of note is some metals react with acids to create hydrogen gas. So that's another property of um, acids. All right, acids can conduct electricity, um, and then some batteries have acids in them. So because acids can conduct electricity, that's why we put um, the acids in the batteries. And examples are um, right here, we've got a kind of double A battery. Okay, and if you can read the side, or if you get a battery and you read the side, it will say whether it has an acid in it. Also, car batteries, some of those have acids. And you can see here where the acid has eaten through the casing of the battery and is coming out. And of course, if you see that happen, you need to make sure you dispose of that battery properly. All right, everyday acids. There's vitamin C is an acid and it's present in fruits, such as lemons and oranges. Acids in our stomach help us digest food. So believe it or not, when you eat things, there's acid in there and it churns around and it breaks down your food. All right, hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid are used extensively in industry, and they're used for cleaning agents and in fertilizers. So now we're going to switch over to bases. Bases are compounds that produce hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. So you can see here, we have sodium hydroxide. It has an OH in it. See, the OH is at the end. Okay, so we take NaOH, and when you put it in water, the Na will separate from the OH. And so we call this a hydroxide ion. And we can tell in a chemical formula if we have a base because bases end in an OH. All right, so properties of bases. Bases taste bitter and bases feel slippery. So things like soap. If you ever touch soap, it feels really slippery. Same thing with detergent. Now, I would not say to taste soap or detergent, but um, it does have a bit of a bitter taste. Sometimes there's some other things that you'll eat and you can tell that it tastes bitter and they can have um, a base in them. Okay, and just to kind of note here, there's a slip and slide, <laughs> that's the picture, that it, the slip and slide is not a base, but it just shows something that's slippery and trying to explain what that word means, if you didn't know what slippery meant. 
All right, other properties of bases. Bases can corrode, corrode metals. Bases can conduct electricity. Notice that's the same thing as acids. All right, some example of everyday bases. We have drain cleaners. Um, if you've ever used uh, Drano, so if your sink or your um, bathtub is clogged, you pour Drano down that and it breaks it up. Some household cleaning products have ammonia in them, and so those can help clean and break down um, grease on different things. Cement is, ma is made using a base calcium hydroxide, so that's one of the substances you mix together in the big cement mixer to um, then produce your cement. And then also bases neutralize excess stomach acid. So if you have um, acid reflux, okay, or that acid burn in your stomach, you can take something like Tums or Rolaids, and those are bases, and that helps neutralize that acid so your stomach doesn't feel so sour or upset. All right, so um, how do we know if we have an acid or a base or something that's neutral? So the, to do that, we measure pH. pH stands for or means potential hydrogen. pH measures the acidity or base acidity of something, and the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. So right in the middle here, exactly in the middle, is neutral, and that's 7. Okay, now sometimes when we do things, if it's like between 6 and 8, we'll say that it's neutral. Um, even though, like, technically only 7 is neutral, okay? And then we'll see kind of the rest of the scale here. I want you to note that if it's strongly acidic, we're down here low on the scale 0 through 2. If we're strongly basic, we're like 12 through 14. And then we also have two other terms. We have this weak acid, which is kind of anything in the middle, maybe between like 4 and 6-ish. And then we have weak bases that are kind of between 8 and 10. Okay, so we have strong acids, then weak acids, neutral, weak bases, and strong bases. So it kind of makes sense if you're really strong and really like, you know, on one side or the other, you feel strongly about it, you would consider them to be on opposite sides of each other, and that's where we use and why we use the term strong. All right, so neutral is in the middle, as I mentioned before. And then acids are less than 7. So here on this scale, we have neutral, and acids are going to be less than 7. And an example that you'll use in class is vinegar. Vinegar is actually the strongest acid you will use. And just to kind of note, the less the pH, the stronger the acid. So something like battery acid or sulfuric acid is strong, and it's down here. Okay. And then bases are more than 7. So this side of our scale. And an example will be ammonia that you'll use in class. And the less the pH, the weaker the base. So this is just kind of to me, if you have something between like 8 and 10, it's a weak base. Indicators. Indicator, an indicator is a substance that shows the strength of acids or bases using a color change. So you put in an acid and a base, and if it changes color, you can say, oh, look what I have. Uh, it's qualitative. Litmus paper is one of our indicators. It detects if the substance is an acid or a base. And you can see here we have blue litmus paper and then red litmus paper. All right, so litmus paper changes color in the presence of an acid or a base. Basically, if you dip the litmus paper in an acid or a base, um, it might change color. All right, so how does this work? In the presence of an acid, litmus paper will turn or will be red. So here is an example. We have blue litmus paper. They dropped acid on it and it turned red. So blue litmus paper turned red. It says, no, blue litmus paper indicates that if a substance is an acid or not. Okay? So you cannot use it to indicate if it's a base or neutral. So if I take blue litmus paper and I drop anything that's a base or it's neutral, blue litmus paper will stay blue. So the only time it changes color is with an acid. On the opposite side of that, in the presence of a base, the bases turn litmus paper blue, or it stays blue. So look at this here, red litmus paper with a drop of base. You can see that it says red litmus paper indicates that if a substance is a base or not. Okay? And you cannot use it to indicate if it's an acid or neutral. 
So if I take red litmus paper and I drop something on it and it turns blue, I'm like, oh, I have a base. If it stays red, I'll say, well, it's either an acid or it's neutral. All right, so some other ways to measure pH, which are a little bit better because they have a little bit more detail. You can use pH paper or a pH probe. These methods tell us the strength of the acid or the base. So is it a weak acid or a strong acid, a weak base or a strong base? So the pH paper has a color chart or scale that goes with it. So basically you take the piece of paper, you dip it in your solution, and if it's red to orange, it's an acid. If it's green to blue, it's a base. And then if it's somewhere in the yellow range, you say, oh, it's neutral. So now, once you get the color change on your little piece of pH paper, you then get to match it up here to the scale, and then you have a number, and that's why it's quantitative. pH probes will show you how those work, but basically you put them in, it's computerized, it gives you an actual number, okay? All right, qualitative. Another one is cabbage juice. Um, we call it a relative indicator. And the reason we call it a relative indicator is because literally what you do to make it is cut up cabbage, boil it, and then you get the liquid, and it kind of has this um, kind of color here, purplish color. And then you, when you put your acid or your base in it, it changes color, okay? And you have to use red cabbage. You can't just use regular cabbage. You have to have red cabbage. And you see this sometimes like in your salads that you eat at home or if you go to like McDonald's or something. All right, each cabbage juice batch is different. So it's relative to the batch you just made, not the previous batch. So every time you boil cabbage, it might look a little more purple or a little more blue, a little more intense in color, deep in color, less in color. So every time you make a batch of cabbage juice, you have to make a scale like this, okay, with it and put different acids and bases in it so you can have the scale and then you can compare and figure out what you have based on like what color it is. All right, so the last thing to know about all this um, for right now is kind of giving you a reminder about acid rain. You probably learned about it when you took life science. And um, normal rain is slightly acidic due to the carbon dioxide in the air. So you can see here the water will combine with the carbon dioxide and you get this carbonic acid. Notice it has an H in the front, so we know that it's an acid. Now it's a really weak acid, so regular rain um, is fairly harmless, okay? And like I said, we know it's an acid because it has an H. Now, sometimes if you get nitrogen or sulfur oxide in the air, you get a more concentrated or stronger acid rain. That's where acid rain comes from. So things like um, factories and things give off this nitric and sulfuric acid, and therefore uh, you end up with acid rain, and it does things like it can um, cause the soil to be too acidic and plants won't grow in it, or as you can see with the statue, it breaks down the statue. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some information about acids, bases, and neutral substances, and you'll learn more about all of these things when you are in class and doing the lab. You'll really like it. See ya.